Hi, I'm Michael Beinhorn. Hope you're doing well. You're listening to Whatever Nevermind. Let me introduce my guest. Uh, I'm speaking with uh, producer Michael Beinhorn. Uh, Michael, welcome to the program. Thank you. Well, Michael, before we get into the album uh, uh, Super Unknown, tell me a little bit about your background. Uh, Share with us, like, what would you consider your big break that got you into production? I suppose that would have been when I co-produced and co-wrote a song called Rocket um, for Herbie Hancock in 1983. Familiar. Uh, And, uh, yeah, um, we wound up... We wound up uh, doing an entire record with him, and uh, that was the uh, that was the big song off that record. And uh, I guess a lot of people liked it because <laughs> <laughs> um, it, uh, it 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 did extremely well, and it just kind of kick started my career. Uh, I was working with another individual at the time as a production team, and we dissolved that um, not long after. So I was kind of on my own for a long time. And then uh, about four years later, I got introduced to a relatively unknown band in Los Angeles called the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And from there, things started to uh, take off. And now that's a much different type of music than what you were doing with Herbie Hancock. Uh, I assume you're a musician of some note. Is, is What's your key instrument? Um, well, uh, that's very kind of you to say. However, I don't really fancy myself as being <laughs> much of a player. Um, I do dabble in keys. I'm, and uh, I think what I'm most proficient in really in terms of musical instruments is a synthesizer okay. as a, a programmer. Um, now I'm calling you from uh, uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. One of our, um, you, you, you uh, produced a record that's pretty big from one of our local bands here. Soul oh, Asylum. yeah. <laughs> uh, Grave Dancers Union. Uh, any fun anecdotes you can share quickly about working with those guys? Um, oh, <laughs> well, there were, geez, there were so many of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll have to have it back on. No, I was, you know, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I, I've got a two and a half year old child, so my, my, uh, my, my ability, my, my, my recall is kind of, is, is running at half speed these days. Oh, no problem. Uh, yeah, we've been um, there. No, it was, it was, uh, yeah, right. Uh, no, it was, it was, it was a great record to make. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it, it was wonderful. I mean, the Dave, it was, is a terrific songwriter. I mean, he had all, he had pretty much all the music ready to go when we started working, and it was, uh, it was, it, it was a, it, it really came out great. I was very happy with it, and I think they were too. And then uh, jumping ahead then to uh, the record we're going to talk about today, Super Unknown from Soundgarden. How did you get pulled into that? At that point, they I think they've been working with Terry Date for the most part. That's correct, yeah. They've been working with Terry Date, uh, and I think they just wanted to try something new. And uh, I was speaking to a gentleman who was managing me at the time, and he said, you know, you should really, you should really go for this next Soundgarden record. And I was like, oh, and... <laughs> the fun, the the funnier thing about it was, it's like I think I've heard a couple of records of theirs, <laughs> um, maybe one, <laughs> and you know he said one thing. It looks like they've already got a producer for the project, although it hasn't been officially like um, it, it hasn't been officially declared any place, you know. And I was like, well, Do you know who? Why should I? Uh, I think it was going to be Rick Rubin. Oh boy, <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, and I was like, well, why should I bother if they already have someone? He's like, look, you should just go try it anyway. Just do it and see what happens. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do it. And I went up there, and somehow, <laughs> I'm still not sure uh, how it worked. I was able to beguile them into, uh, in, you know, in, in, into hiring me to produce the record. The only the only caveat was that we had to um, we we actually had to go into a studio and work on a couple of songs just to see how it would feel, which was kind of an odd. It was sort of an odd request under the circumstances. Yeah. Because, well, I mean, it, it, there there were two random songs. They didn't have anything to do with the record we were about to make, and. The record we were going to make would have been under much different conditions, but I was like, okay, fine, whatever it takes. 
I, I want to. This is exciting. I want to do it. So yeah, let's go for it. What were the two songs? Uh, the songs are called um, uh, "No Attention" and "She Likes Surprises." Okay. Oh. Yeah, I think they wound up. I think they wound up on like a vinyl version of the record, or you know, some kind of additions. Yeah. To the album somewhere along the line. Yeah, they did that but deluxe whole yeah, monster yeah, box exactly. out of this record. So. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, a, as a producer, like I, you know that. I've talked to a handful of them, and and they kind of approach things a little differently. For you, how how do you what do you feel your job is as, as a producer once you're basically attached to a project? Well, you know, it's it's variable. You know, I try and I I, I try and 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 help the artist in all the areas that uh, I feel. And I have to work at this from a very kind of from an innate kind of instinct based place where, where you know, where I feel that they might be lacking mm -hmm. and to try and torque up their strengths as much as I can so that uh, they make the best possible record that they can make. I, I mean, I think by taking care of those two positions, you've pretty much covered the entire range of what the artist is going to need over the course of a recording project. Would you by chance recall what you felt their strengths were and what you thought they needed to improve? Well, yeah. Um, they, I think one of, the, one of the most amazing things about them was just the kind of, the overall vibe that they projected as a band together. I mean, they were, they were incredibly powerful personalities, and I think that, that comes through in all their work. Uh, and... You know, it's it's kind of hard to argue that Chris was one of the greatest rock singers who ever lived. Yeah. Uh, you know, and there was there was a core to them that I just felt they'd never really touched. There was just there was an essence to them that I felt that they'd never really gotten to, and while I have absolutely nothing bad to say about their the, any of the predecessors to the record that we did, mm -hmm. I did feel that there was a lot of like fat, you know, that there were kind of, there were these jams that went on for a while. And to me, that was stuff that if you wanted to see a band live, you could go see them do that. You know, if you're going to make a record, like when you listen to a jam over and over again, it's not a jam anymore because you start going off. Yeah. The <laughs> <laughs> so I've never what, heard what was... that before. That's uh, perfectly stated. <laughs> Well, what was meant as an imp what would have been, you know, meant as an imp improvised thing becomes mm -hmm. part. It becomes a structural, it becomes a structural construct. Construct after a while, it becomes something, you know, because you 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 start remembering things, and it's not the, the spontaneity begins to kind of melt away. Yeah. Uh, and after a while, you even become your your brain is expecting to hear the improv done exactly the way it is and if the band performs the song live and they don't play it exactly the same way there's going to be something in you know in your brain that's a little disappointed by that i'm i'm not i'm not interested in capturing those aspects um you know at least from a from the perspective of an actual performance that are improvised the nuances however of a of a performance that that, that that pertain directly to an actual stru a structure like a, uh, like a vocal performance for mm -hmm. example that has a and you know that's part of what I have to do as a producer is listen to all the nuances and all the subtleties and select or at least be an arbiter I guess in the selection process of what finally gets picked and used on the, uh, you know, on the final recording that everyone hears. Uh, and, you know, I, I there, there was, it felt to me like there was a deeper level to this band in terms of, in terms of structures, in terms of songwriting, in terms of composition, in terms of creating ideas that had, that had a real resonance to them in terms of in, in terms of structural elements, and to me, I felt that it was really important to bring that out while not losing any of the rawness and the power. And in fact, amplifying that, like finding really subtle aspects of what I felt made 
the band so vital and so exciting you know uh like i mean as an example um I noticed when I listened to Chris sing that his voice was so powerful that there was always a little expulsion of air at the end of some of his lines. You could hear him pushing out from his stomach Ugh, like that right mm -hmm. at the end. And to me, that was so sexy. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and I, I was listening to other records he did and you couldn't really make it out. Like you had to listen for it. And I was like, why in God's name did the people who recorded this guy, why didn't they like try and, amplify that in some way or make it a little bit more evident because there's, there's something so raw and sensual about that like why you wouldn't want to make that be kind of a little bit more apparent because it's not you know it's not something that you're immediately going to notice but it's something that you hear and it becomes part of the entire presentation you know it's things like that were very important to me like the d I, I really i wanted to focus on a lot of details on there on the on the record well, I, you, I definitely think you delivered on that um, end. Um, Thank you. Were, were you were you? This is really early in digital recording, right? So I'm assuming this is all done on tape. Yeah, that's correct. You know, um, uh, I was talking to the engineer on on Siamese Dream, and he talked about how they did drum takes, and it just blew my my mind. Did you record like like four or five takes of one drum track, and then splice up the tape physically and put together one, or would you take one clean cut? Um. It, it it varies you know it depends who the drummer is i mean on I've this done, record i'm asking i guess uh uh on on super unknown i'm pretty sure that we didn't do any edits okay um i didn't think but i mean matt is well i mean i in saying that i wouldn't want to be that have that be a reflection of anyone else certainly not jimmy chamberlain who's oh a right right phenomenal who's a phenomenal drummer you know but Matt didn't really need to do any edits. Like he would, I found the only, the only, the only area where I found Matt was like, you know, where, 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 you know, you would, you would basically say this take is better than that take was that some of them didn't seem as energetic. Okay. That was kind of the basis on which I was judging the drum takes. And when he hit it, it was so incredibly obvious that, you know, everyone who was in the control room would look at each other and go like, Oh yeah. <laughs> that is definitely the one. Now, and uh, I read uh, in preparing for this that Adam Casper, uh, who worked with you as an engineer on this record, he was actually the house engineer at Bad Animal Studio. Um, is that commonplace that you just kind of work with the house engineer, or is, or do do producers like yourself kind of were you kind of forced to work with him? I guess is kind of where I'm going to, or did, was it just not that big a deal? I, I'm not really well, phrasing that well. Adam was Adam was the assistant on the record. He wasn't the engineer. Okay. Yeah, I the engineer on that record was a guy named Jason Corsaro. Um, you know that that's who, someone you would have brought in. I brought him in. Yeah. Okay, I brought him in. No, Adam actually, the reason that Adam worked on that record was that Adam actually petitioned <laughs> to do it it was wonderful like he sent me a, he sent me like a cv um mm. and no one had ever done anything like that before and i was like if this guy is gonna have the balls to do something like that he is definitely the person that i want on this project okay you know so i was very i was extremely grateful to have someone who was that you know who, who had that kind of nerve to say like this is what i'm going to do to get on this project i want to do it so badly you know, I was really impressed by that. Well, I, that that makes a whole lot more sense to me, I guess. I, it just stuck out that I was reading a Spin Magazine interview, and it really didn't blur, break it down like you did, of course. Um, well, it, I'm also not breaking news that you guys, you and the band, clashed a bit during the recording of this. Um, my impression, That's it mildly. Yeah. All right, well, I'd love to get into some of that stuff. I, I'm not. I'm not trying to to dig up wounds or anything like that. I do find it interesting, oh. though. Um, no, 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 man. It's it really ask away. It doesn't bother me okay. at all. My my impression was it wasn't like um because sometimes you work with a band and one member is really the more difficult one. It seems like Soundgarden almost had a circling the wagons kind of mentality when it came to working with you. Is that is that accurate? Did I pick up that vibrate? That's actually pretty good. Um, I I never really thought about it that way. Um. As far as the circling the wagons mentality, it was interesting because I think that they were expecting that we were going to make a different record than the record that we actually made. How would you um, explain that? 
Well, I realized after I got the gig that they hadn't really been preparing to make sort of like the record of their lives. Mm. What they wanted to do was make a record relatively quickly and just get back on the road and start touring again. Uh, that kind of which... surprises me. Well, it surprised me too. Uh, and it, it seemed kind of odd because like the entire world was sort of looking at Soundgarden going like, okay, this is going to be the next band that hits. Like th these, mm -hmm. these, this, these guys are going to be huge. All they have to do is make the right record. And see, I came into the project with that understanding. I was like, okay, this is my job. I have this responsibility to deliver this for this artist. So this is what, we're, this is what I'm prepared to do here to make, to help this artist make the, the record of their lives basically. And I realized you know, not long after that, that that wasn't, that we weren't all exactly on the same page. Uh, and when I got demos for the record, actually, I listened to this cassette because it was only one and there were about 11 songs on it. And maybe four of them were songs that we wound up recording. The rest of it was just kind of like, eh, you know, and I had to tell them, uh, you guys, like, Honestly, I think we need to do some more writing before we go into a, a recording studio and start and tracking this. And, you know, that wasn't really a good, that wasn't a, that wasn't good footing for me to kind of step off mm. on. Uh, and it didn't put me in the best position with the band <laughs> <laughs> at that point. I, they weren't very happy to hear that. I mean, they went along with it, which I was, I mean, I was really grateful, but um, it was tough. Like they didn't, they didn't want to get into the experimentation part of it. Um, really? Uh, I mean, it wasn't even really experimentation. I had a very specific idea of what I wanted this record to sound like. I wanted it to be a combination of elements that were very, that were very deep, that, that were extremely detail oriented, but were extremely raw, you know, dirty and, and, and punchy. I was listening to a lot of electronic music mm. uh, and I wanted to do something that just kind of cut really against the grain of the type of rock music that people were making then, especially the type of music that people were making coming out of Seattle because there was a real movement at that point, as you know. Yeah. And I just, I, I, I didn't, I didn't feel that this record should be part of that. I felt like it could be something more than that, something that you wouldn't necessarily align with a, you know, a fashion statement like grunge. Mm -hmm. um, of course, <laughs> you're basing this interview on Rolling Stone's greatest mm. grunge record. So I guess I wasn't able to eclipse that entirely. <laughs> I, 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 would, I actually would disagree with you on that. If, if you care to know... I'm not a huge fan of Rolling Stone. I went with this list because despite that not my favorite cup of tea, they're they're credible to a certain extent. But also it just yeah. kind of keeps me on a path where I'm not like dictating you know, I'm just going to hammer through them. We're going to do an honest breakdown of each each one and and kind of celebrate grunge as a whole and I think Soundgarden sure. definitely belongs in that conversation. This album is next level in my opinion. I, and I don't think I'm the only person to tell you that, but well, thanks. <laughs> um, but I mean that's a, that's going a long way to trying to answer your question and say yeah it was a real it was a hard record to make and there was a lot of headbutting going on I mean there was definitely a lot of arguing <laughs> and uh, I mean I, I have to give the band a lot of credit though they hung with it even yeah. though they disagreed with a lot of the aesthetic choices that were made do you have uh, any um, we can laugh about it now type arguments you'd like to share um, let me think. <laughs> I'm hitting you out of the blue on it, so I get it. But uh... yeah, no, I'm I, I'm I'm doing the best. I'm I'm doing the best I can. Um, no, I mean, uh, well, I read a story about you breaking a door in the studio. Is that? Uh... Oh shit! Wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's really funny. But that had nothing to do with like that had nothing to do with the band. I had like <laughs> the worst migraine of my life. Oh. <laughs> I had the worst migraine of my life and it was and I, I was in so much pain that I shoved like this this airlock like this enormous door and I mean I'm not particularly large but I actually busted it right off its hinges to this day I'm not sure how I did it 
but yeah, no, that that had nothing to do with being angry at anyone. <laughs> That's too bad. <laughs> just, just had a, yeah, I guess it was a really expensive door too. <laughs> it really oh, wow. sucked. Yeah, I mean, you get a migraine on top of that, an eighteen hundred dollar bill for a door. Well, yeah, those studio doors <laughs> tend to be built pretty solid for the sound, you know, reason, but. Yeah, no, they 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 worked really well. Um, <laughs> wow, I'm surprised that you. Uh, thanks, thanks for throwing that one at me. <laughs> that set me on my toes. Um, <clears throat> um, as far as we can laugh about it, I don't think those guys ever really forgave me for like the fights that we got or the disagreements that we had. Aww. Um No, actually, I, I think I got an apology from one of them at the end of the record. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but it's. It's it's all water under the bridge at this sure. point, you know. Like, it had to be that way. I don't begrudge them for how they felt about it. I mean, this this is definitely new territory for all of us to go into, and you know, I mean, I I'm just glad that I felt so sure about the direction that we were headed, and also the fact that like some of the material on the most of the record is just undeniable. Ah, the whole thing. <laughs> the whole record it's a one it's a wonderful piece of work and yeah. to this day i'm incre like incredibly proud to have been associated with it and i feel really fortunate about that i'm very grateful and well, and I, I and i love those guys for giving me the opportunity to work with them but conflict can actually be an asset you know when when you're dealing with creating something you know what i mean passion can push oh, yeah. somebody to a limit that they might not go with you know what i mean well, it's that, but it also can it, it can it can give a person the ability to voice why they feel strongly about something. Oh, that's well said. Well, it's but it, it's interesting because like if you feel if you have so much conviction about something, and someone challenges you in a way where they they feel for one reason that they're right about something, but you know that you're right, you're able. The, the, the conflict gives you the ability to be able to express to them why it is that you feel that things need to go the direction that you feel that they need to go in. And if you're able to convince them, or at least to, uh, arrive at some sort of compromise where both sides are kind of are, are accommodated, um, the, the, the end result can be absolutely stupendous. And in, in this case, it often was. Is it true that they would sing Kumbaya to you at certain points to kind of be dicks or, or you know, to fuck with you, I guess is a better way to put it? I don't remember that. Okay. I found um, that in, uh, Kim, Kim Thale said that in a different interview, but. I remember, a, I remember a bunch of other things. I mean, we used to mess with each other very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I it. actually have some recordings of me just like being absolutely horrible to Kim. Um, you know, but Kim 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 is uh, not someone who takes that kind of stuff lightly. He'll give you as he'll give you as good as he gets. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we just we 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 went through the ringer on that one. I found some kind of conflicting information, so maybe you can help answer this. Um, it sounds like this record took a while to make, not surprisingly, but how long do you do you recall? Yeah. Uh, from the time that we started recording, it was about three and a half months. Okay. They had about a three-week tour that they did with Neil Young. Uh, so we had to stop when they did that. Uh, and before that, it was about two months of pre-production to assemble all the songs and get the songs prepped and ready to be recorded. Was the pre-production done in Seattle as well? Uh, well, I was I was living in Connecticut, so I would I was. I would go back and forth, but for the most part, it was them working on music in Seattle and sending me sending me okay. music to listen to. Once uh, once recording started, did you stay in Seattle then, or? Yeah, yeah, I was there for the duration, except for the uh, tour that they did. Uh, paint paint the picture. Then you just staying at a hotel. Uh, you you shack up with uh, Cornell. Or... <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it was nothing like that. Um, I no, I they they put me up in corporate apartments. Okay, um, in in downtown Seattle. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think I was like a couple of blocks away from the Pike market and stuff. So would that have been like your first real experience spending time in Seattle? That's a little off base, but just asking. Um, oh no, it's okay. Uh, I'd been there. No, I, I, I'd made a record there before. Um, 
Yeah, it was before. Um, so I'd spent some time there. You know, uh, I I have a general question for you as a producer. Now, you mentioned like they would send you demos and stuff. When a band that you're going to work with sends you demos, do you prefer them to be kind of stripped as stripped down as they can be? I've heard someone say that sometimes, I can't remember the word it was, but basically overproduced. Like they worked a little too hard to slicken up the uh, the, the demo, and it makes you less interested. It, like it, it, It's almost like they... If it's if it's bare bones, it's easier for the producer to kind of come up with his own vision for the song. Is that how you feel? Um, I think it, it like like so many other things, it's variable. It's really kind of down to who the artist is, what the record's going to be like, you know, what the what what the artist's interpretation or intent for the record happens to be. You know, I mean, in the case of this band, they were all really good at. Uh, you know, at organizing their ideas, uh, you know, um, Matt and Chris in particular were able to provide, you know, pretty finished pieces of work. And with Chris, you had someone who basically could play every instrument. Like if he gave me a demo, he played all the instruments on it. He wrote all the parts. Um, obviously he sang the song. Yeah. He, you know, he, he, he wrote the melodies, he wrote the lyrics. I mean, he basically covered every bass from, from soup to nuts. So there wouldn't have been anything that I would say to Chris, you know, I, I, I would have listened to on one of Chris's demos and gone like, ah, he went too far. You mm -hmm. know, he did exactly what needed to be done on all of them. And, uh, you know, I, I, I felt like with this record really wasn't, it wasn't about me kind of having a uh, you know, trying to trying to get my licks in, so to speak. Like it was about it, it. It really felt more about trying to assemble the right, I guess, cadre, if you will, of material um, to present. You know, to make the right presentation, and then have the um, and then kind of and then worry about the aesthetics. Like I. Once, once we had a song like Black Hole Sun mm. in place, to me, like in many ways, that really defined what this record was going to become. I mean, that that's hearing that song jump started me on so many different levels in terms of what what we could do and how far we could go and what kind, you know, how far I would be able to go um, creatively in in helping forge a sound for it. Uh, uh, so I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have put those, any kind of constraints on them in terms of, you know, how they wanted to deliver, uh, demos for, you know, for the record. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, do you know what kind of budget, uh, they had for Super Unknown? I assume you're involved um, yeah, in it that. Was, it was pretty good. I mean, it was around, I think it was like 400,000 bucks. Okay. How much of that did you take? <laughs> <laughs> not not a whole lot. <laughs> uh, I kid, I kid. Um, not a whole lot. No, uh, I read that you. Re I made. I made it. Believe me, I made up for it in the back end. Okay. Yeah. Sure. The thing that was wildly successful record. I I, I sure hope uh, uh, the fruits were were spread around. But um, I, uh, it worked out just fine. I'm. There's no possible way I could complain. That's good to hear. Uh, you, I read that you recorded the songs one at a time. Is that accurate? We recorded them four at a time. Okay. They decided that they wanted to make the record that way. They wanted to. Do that was their decision. Songs in batches. That was their decision. They okay. wanted to do songs in batches of four. Um, it was just a, you know, it was just a thing they wanted to do, and I was like, okay, that's great. Well, um, one thing that that's pretty important to almost any rock record, especially you know, recorded before digital. Um, it's kind of a, a cohesive, at least drum sound. I think you can kind of catch up with all the other stuff and even bring in different elements and not lose it. But so, so as geeky as this might be, I, I do find it interesting. Mm -hmm. Would you have left mm -hmm. just basically the drum set fully mic'd, the the board set the way it is, or you know, you know what I mean? So basically, you do the four songs, you don't play drums again until the, the next batch, do, or would you reset up and reconfigure every time? Well. You know, it's it's interesting because for the record, we we had um, we had two sets. We had two separate sets. 
and you can hear there's a ch- there's a, a difference in drum sound from song mm-hmm. to song like some of them are a little bit washier than others um which is not my preference by the way i don't like roomy washy drums but they insisted and that's you know that's obviously not an argument that that's worth having and in the end i'm glad that i'm glad that matt stuck to his guns on that one because I feel like, I mean, the, you know, the record sounds the way it sounds. It's not like you can really argue with that. Um, right. But we had two completely different setups um, for some of the songs. And, you know, he'd basically go to one and then the other, depending on how he felt or, you know, what the song, what he felt the song called for. I mean, we, we would we would basically, we would move stuff around from, you know, from session to session. Like when we done, get done with a batch of four we'd come back to the next batch and, you know, we might want to change something here or there. Um, I, I was less interested in the, in the more roomy kit, you know, it had less mics. I always, I, I, I love detail as I th- suppose I've probably implied already. Sure. Uh, and I like, I like pinpointing certain aspects <laughs> of certain instrument sounds. And, uh, you know, I was just constantly tinkering with the drum sound on the more mic'd up kit. Uh, and, uh, you know, as time went, went by, you would just, I don't know if you'd use the word refine, but, you know, I'd just be tweaking stuff constantly, okay. trying to hone it more. It, it, it still sounds cohesive from beginning to end, though, so uh, that, that's pretty impressive to hear. I, it sounds like you basically you did less tweaking as it went, as the record got deeper, or...? No, I did more. <laughs> no, no, that, no, no. But the, but the, but the thing that, the, the, the things that add the cohesion are the, you know, the drummer, it, or is the, the drummer in the, in the room that we were in. We were in the same room. Okay. You know, we didn't, we didn't move, we didn't move the drums from their, from their location points. In the rooms, I mean, in the room, and you know, it's the same guy playing drums. I mean, Matt is the kind of drummer where you put him up on. 10 different drum kits and he'll make them all sound pretty much the same Okay, <clears throat> because he has a sound. He is a very recognizable drummer in every sense of the word. There's some, some musicians have that capability to take any instrument that they play and make it sound like them. There's going to be a consistency. I know a bunch of guitarists who can do this, right? You know, it doesn't matter what instrument they're playing through, what amplifier they're playing through, no matter what you do, it's still going, there's still going to be an element of them. What about guitar tones then? Uh, who is more interested in kind of, because uh, there's a lot of really, there's a lot of color to the, the guitar tones from song to song on yeah. the, on this record. Um, who is more involved in that? Like, I really want to try to mess with this a little bit. Would it be Chris or Kim or? Me. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Me, baby. No, I look, I'm good. I got to be honest. I was the person who wanted to who wanted to play with guitar tones like Chris. I I remember we went on a um, on a buying. Well, it was it didn't really wind up being much of a spree, but we went to a local music store to pick up some gear for the record. Okay, Uh, you know, uh, I don't know why I kind of. I, I, I kind of urged him to do this, but we wound up getting him a um, a Marshall, like a JMP 70s Fawn half stack with a slant cab. Uh, and um, it was like, it was, yeah, it was a 50 watt. And um, that was half of the guitar sound for the record. We basically never deviated from this rig. Uh, and he had a really nice assortment of guitars. I think the other one we got him the one we got him there was like a jazz master. Meanwhile, Kim, he he couldn't care less. <laughs> okay. He had these like um, he had these PVs, this PV like VTM twenty or something like that. The VTM one twenty. Huh? The VTM one twenty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Thank you. I'm sorry. I some PV stuff actually does sound good. Like they make. <laughs> No, they they make it. They make an amp called the Decade, which is a tiny little guitar amplifier, yeah. and it's one of my favorite amplifiers. <laughs> it's great, you know. I think you can get one of these things for like fifty bucks. Okay, uh, and it's a great amp. I mean, you don't want to use it for everything, but it's they're a, no it's, more it's, for the bass rig and PO, PA equipment, especially at that time. Yeah, well, whatever the case, 
this amplifier did not sound good. It didn't certainly didn't stack up against what um, what Chris had, and it also didn't deliver the kinds of tone. Like it just it sounded really, really like no personality at all, even a little bit metally. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm you know quite familiar with that amp. Oh, okay. Well, I hope I'm not insulting you. Not at all. I, you haven't said nothing I, I wouldn't uh, echo, especially the metal part. Okay. It is more of a metal amp. Yeah. But, it, you know, PPM, yeah, I mean, PV at the time was kind of chasing it and trying to make their own name in the guitar amp game. So yeah, I, I don't yeah. recall anybody else playing them, but but Kim is, is why it kind of stands out. But Yeah, and it, it, it just it wasn't the the right guitar sound for the record. I didn't want to make a metal record either. I didn't want to make something that you could typify by genre. I wanted to make something that you could typify by emotion, by hearing it. It would jar you in a certain way. Now, if you're starting you know? out as a band, it was an affordable amp that would be loud and, and reliable for you. Once you're at this level of Soundgarden, you probably want to move on to something else. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So... You know, I, I, we kind of like dug around and dug around. And finally, um, the, I, I matched that, um, the Marshall half stack rig with a, uh, believe it or not, a Mesa boogie dual rectifier, mm. um, with a Mesa cab, a, a straight cab. And I, I, I'm not a fan of the dual rectifier on its own, but for some reason, when I put it together with that Marshall, it just did something wonderful. Hmm. It just sounded great. And that was the basis of all the guitar sounds on the record. Uh, that rig right there, we plugged everything into it. And I would just go out there and tweak until I felt that I had a sound that I, that I liked. Uh, you know, and we'd go back in and, and record it. And that was the, that's how all the guitar sounds were done. You know, Chris had a really good a solid collection of guitars. He had that jazz master. Of course, he had those amazing <laughs> Gretsch guitars. He had that, you know, the single and the double cutaway, which are, I mean, I, I would say that they're probably the best examples of those guitars I've ever okay. heard in my life. They're wonderful guitars. Well, you mentioned Black Hole Sun. There's a lot of, like, kind of o- layered effects on some of that stuff, but what about, like, let's say Super Unknown, the opening riff there. To me, that, that that's a very nasally and dirty, but at the same time, very smooth. If it, uh, mm-hmm. uh, how, that That's more than just a guitar, cable, and head thing going on there, right? Uh, no. Come on. <laughs> it, it's, it, it really isn't. Huh. It really isn't. I'm telling you, I mean, so, this, there was so much serendipity in the making of this record. Oh, as I love much that as word. we fought, as much, you know, and, and there were, you know, getting guitar sounds, especially with Kim. Actually, it took like days, literally days to get a guitar sound. It was terrible. <laughs> it was really, really hard to do. <laughs> and that's it's not because Kim's a, a bad guitarist, quite the opposite. Just, you know. He, you know, he didn't want to sit there and, and keep trying to get a tone and like, you know, I got frustrated, he got frustrated. It was, you know, it, it was unpleasant. But like so much magic through through all the, the tension, so much magic happened. I mean, you have moments like that. I'll, I'll tell you something. And when we were recording that and I think I was the only person <laughs> throughout the making of the record that was excited about it at all hmm. at the end of the night oh and adam was i know that adam was very excited about it i think he was really into it um adam was kind of like <laughs> he, he was sort of my in hindsight he was kind of like my rock <laughs> hmm, nice <laughs> because he was the only person who was really kind of like going like wow this is going to be great everyone else was like Meh. <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the night, I would sit down and listen to what we'd done. And I just, I'd find myself like listening to the same song like five, six times in a row. I keep playing it over and over again. I was like, Jesus Christ, this is incredible. <laughs> so that's normal. Yeah. Um, it's it's normal if you're enjoying what you're doing. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, if you're not like, you probably don't even want to, you know, do a... <laughs> you know, a recap of, of the day's work. But I would be sitting there, like, people would be like, look, I got to get out of here. And I'd be like, go. I'm listening to this again. I love this. It's amazing. Right on. You know, uh, it was really funny, actually, because while we were um, making the record, after we'd done, like, the first batch, uh, 
the product manager from a and m this guy Jim Garano, who later on managed Chris and became a very very successful manager um he came to the studio to listen to what we were doing, and you know we had the first batch of four songs, one of which was Spoon Man, which honestly I wasn't a fan of at the time yeah i uh, me either <laughs> it's funny i didn't I just didn't care for it. It doesn't you know, click with me, and I, I was a big fan. Yeah, um, but uh, you know, he came, he sat down, he listened to the four songs, and he got up. He said thanks, and he left. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I was so mad. I was like, you, you just walked out of the room listening this is going to be the most important rock record you guys are going to put out at least this year mm. and that's your attitude yeah you know and it was hysterical like three or four months after the record came out he actually called me up and he said i'm so so sorry about that <laughs> oh did, did you like, actually I... say it to him when he walked out or was like uh... no, no no i didn't say okay it to him. That, just, okay i stood there in a state of shock i mean he knew he knew what happened he knew okay he, kind of, he just bailed on us you know, and, and didn't say, hey, it's great, you know, great work. He was just like, cool, thanks. <laughs> wow. Okay. You know, he realized that the response had been somewhat weathering, but it was all fine. I was like, look, it's it's good. You know, the record's gonna is doing great. It's gonna be wonderful for everybody. I'm I'm just I'm happy that you're happy with it. What was your uh, how much experience had you had recording spoon solos before that? <laughs> now that's got to be the trick question of yeah, all yeah, trick yeah. You, at least you paused for a second and then started laughing <laughs> that had None. to be weird though huh what was it i mean I, I really actually want to know how do you record a guy playing i don't even i mean he's just hitting spoons together on his legs and stuff right uh it's a little more than that um no it was it was uh <laughs> I've never really experienced anything like that before. Uh, I didn't expect that kind he, of answer. <laughs> uh, well, no, this guy's a very unusual person. He, oh, uh, of course, he's a whole man. And it wasn't man. just spoons. <laughs> it wasn't just spoons. Uh, oh no, he, he he comes in. Uh, he <coughs> he he's got he had like a a bedroll or something like that, like full of metal implements and stuff like that. Uh. And he just right, unrolled it. So he's like kind of, of oh, yeah, you're, you're about to. You're, so he's rolling this thing out. Yeah, he's rolling it out. Okay. Um, and we just put up a pair of U67s uh, that were in kind of like a, you know, a, a relatively tight ambient position so that we would get a little bit of the room, but mainly him. Mm -hmm. You know, because obviously you can't have something that's really too directional. Um, so you've got to, you, you know... <laughs> That's a good point. I mean, these are these can't are obviously use a 57 like cardio. On that. What's that? You can't use a, a 57. <laughs> uh, no. Yeah, we would be. <laughs> let's try and mic each spoon individually. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, we we had to have something sensitive that we could move that you know where we could capture the area that he was in rather than like getting to you know spot mic ear specific because. You're anticipating that there's going to be some moving around, but we had no idea what, what we were in for, you know, because he said, you're going to want to get it. You want to have a video camera around for this. And the minute the song began, roll, started rolling, he went crazy. I mean, he started, he was smacking himself all over his body with these things. And it wasn't just spoons. It was like bits of metal. He just like, you know, and then he'd reach down and grab something else and be, he'd be bashing himself in the head. It was and as you can imagine, at, after a certain point, there was blood flying everywhere. What? I'm not making this up. Man. Man, so it, and there's a video like through, of it it's like through his too. shirt or what's that? Like through his clothes or? Uh, he he was shirtless. Oh, OK. <laughs> he was shirtless. Uh, it was, uh, you know, I, I don't I don't think any I don't. I don't think any of us really ever got over that day. <laughs> uh, it was a, it was a lot. It was a lot to bear witness to. Oh my <laughs> lord! Uh, now, how long did he play? Because yeah. the solo is not that long. Well, he did about I'm gonna say like five passes, six passes, maybe. Okay. He played through the whole song. It's not just 
<clears throat> it's not just the um, solo section. Is it? Wait a second. It, that's, are you saying that that's actually in the song all the way through? Yeah, I mean, there's bits of it here and there. Like oh, okay, he, he okay. Write it right. in here and there, but he he played the whole way through each time. I mean, he he was bashing him, his body with these spoons and bits of metal, through, you know, like good five, six times, I'd say. Did you ever find out if he liked the song or not? <laughs> Did he... um, I don't think it mattered. Okay. Uh, <laughs> he was a very interesting character. Hmm. Uh, wow. Um, I, I guess I didn't really expect it to be quite as dramatic, but... Uh... Well, there you go. Ask it... <laughs> Ask the right question, you get the right answer. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about some of the songs. Uh, but besides that, uh, "Black Hole Sun," th- you, you, everybody, you mentioned that that kind of shaped the record when you hit that. Now, as you're recording that, kind of, I mean, there's a lot going on in that song. I mean, was the demo? It couldn't have been that produced, right? There was a lot of stuff that we that was added, kind of. Add, I guess what I'm asking is, as you get the the basis of the of the song down. Were they like, hey, let's try this, let's try this, and these kind of things that just kept building onto it? Nope. Really? <laughs> I would like to say I, I would like to say that I did some kind of genius move um, to like make the to add a certain kind of spice to the song, but I I can't and I won't. Uh, sure. Uh, what I can say is that without me, that song wouldn't exist. But that's a whole different story. <laughs> oh, let's hear that. <laughs> Um, no, I, I, but I, I, I do want to say that everything about that song in terms of parts, ideas, structure, well, I mean, I, I made one little tweak in the song and that's it. Okay. Um, that, that was, that was Chris's genius and everything that the, you know, the, the, that the guys could bring to the table. Um, you know, like that drum fill right before the last chorus, which mm-hmm. is just absolutely out, out of this world. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, Chris... That that came out of that just fell out of him. That whole thing, all the guitar parts, all the background vocal parts. Um, I remember when I first heard the cassette tape from that. I just I <laughs> I felt like I was on drugs. It was in, it was incredible. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, and the way the song came about is that I'd received a batch of about. Um, I was getting demos fairly regularly from Chris and you know, some of them were some of them were good, but for the most part they were kind of throwaway ish. And I was beginning to detect a bit of a pattern. I mean, we had I'd say maybe sixty to seventy percent of the record, but we were still missing like this really epic, epic song. And I was like, I've got to talk to this guy because we're about to go down a really bad pathway. And if I don't say something, because I actually I'd received this batch of eleven songs, and not one of them. I mean, I've I listened to them like not too long ago, and they're you know they're they're pretty good. I mean, Chris wrote them, he sang on them, and you know, but they still didn't feel like they were up to the standard of the record that we were going to make. You know, and that's when I knew I had to have a conversation with him, and I spoke with him. And I, you know, it's just like I, you know, I wanted to kind of get into his head a little bit and and understand what was motivating him to write these kind of songs. And eventually, it, I began to realize that he was trying to please uh, his audience. Like he was trying to write songs that he felt would be appropriate for a Soundgarden fan. Oh, okay. And yeah, I mean, as as you can imagine, doing something like that can be extremely dangerous. Because you don't really know who it is that these people are. And I, I, I explain this to them. It's like you can't, you know, you haven't, you're talking about trying to please people whose experiences aren't yours. You know, they like your music because it's you, not because you're trying to please them, you know, not because you're trying to do something that makes, you know, that that, that gives them a certain sense of, I guess, identification with what you're doing. Sure. You know, they connect with you because you're you because it's because your expression is unique you know and you're not talking I, about kiss fans by the way uh so <laughs> no no. <laughs> no definitely definitely not you, you we know, all know so them I, no, so, yeah just kidding exactly just kidding uh, i i know well kim's a big a kiss fan so nice i, 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 I had no, i would have picked the opposite yeah he loves kiss ah. he was a, he's a big kid at least he 
that's the, that's the, he, he loves kiss when we are working together. So, um, huh. uh, but anyway, I asked, I asked Chris, you know, you know, cause we were talking about doing something that would be more of an expression of him, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and, and I was, I was saying to him, look, you know, go back to, you know, go inside, like connect with yourself, make music, write songs that really come from you. And, you know, I, I was like, what are you listening to right now? Like, what, what do you love? What music do you love? And he said, the Beatles and Cream. And I was like, okay, wow. write a song that sounds like the Beatles and Cream, you know? And he was like, well, what if it doesn't sound like Soundgarden? And I said, don't worry if it doesn't sound like Soundgarden. When you guys get together and play the song, it will be Soundgarden because you guys are Soundgarden. Yeah. It's really simple, you know? And he's like, okay, I got it. I was like, yeah, don't worry about it, man. Just roll with this. It's going to be great. And so two and a half, three weeks after the conversation, he sends me this cassette tape. It's got four songs on it. The first song was Fell on Black Days. The minute I heard it, I was like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> this is really good. Yeah. You know, and uh, it's such a great song. Yeah. The next song was a song that... Um, he had Jerry Cantrell come in and play guitar on it. You know, we didn't use it. It was too bluesy, but it was still really good. The second was a song. The third was a song called Tighter and Tighter, which wound up on the record after the one that we did. And I was very sad about that because I actually liked that song very much. And I would have loved to have had it on Super Unknown anyway. Um, and, and we actually began to record it, but the band didn't want to, they didn't want to keep going with it. Um, and the last song was Black Hole yeah. Sun. And from the very moment I started listening to it, I was like, oh, my God. I don't know what this is. I've never heard anything like this before, but it is so good. And I just waited, as I often do, for the thing to fall apart. Because usually when people start out a song with a really great intro, it just kind of it falls apart somewhere. Yeah. You know, so I'm always waiting for this point where the song's going to dissolve and I'm going to be like, OK, this is where the, this is where my heavy lifting part comes in. I have to figure out how to make this thing work. And it never happened. That, yeah. that moment never came for me. I just kept listening to it, waiting for something to fall apart. And it didn't. And I wound up listening to the song 15 times in a row. And I was like. Each time I listened to it, I was more into it and I was more captivated and engaged with it. And I called Chris up and I was like, you know something? You're a fucking genius. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, you've written an amazing song. He's like, he's like, I, call, I told him he was a genius. He's like, really? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this song. And he's like, which one? <laughs> I, you know, and that was where I, I started to realize that he didn't even know what he had, you know, mm. and I went, I started talking to the rest of the guys in the That's band. That's probably I mean, common them, with uh, songwriters, I suppose. Um, some, some, you know, some do, some are, some know what they've got. And sometimes people are like, eh. mm. you know, and I, I called the rest of the guys in the band the next day. And I was like, have you, do you believe this song? And they're like, which, which song? And I was like, that Black Hole Sun song that he wrote, of course. And they're all like, yeah. It's okay. Wow. You know, we'll see if it we'll see if we record it. And I was like, What? <laughs> are we are we can't be talking about the same song here. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. The thing that I heard is amazing. And they're like, Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, there there isn't a spot from beginning to end on that song where where you, you start to lose interest. You know what I mean? It it captivates you from beginning to end. Well, yeah. <laughs> and that's what it's that's what it should that's what the song should do. Well, of course, you know, but you you and I both know that that's not always the case, but it is interesting no. that that fell on black days was on that same demo because I've always found them to almost to be like sister songs on this record. Well, there you go. Well, hey, you you mentioned earlier uh about Chris's singing and that kind of like sexy breath at the end there. Now, he definitely sounds like a guy who can really push it. You 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 confirm that. Was there ever a time that like I don't know. I, I have a, a, a small amount of experience in this, that's, so that's what piqued my curiosity. Was he too loud? Like, where I don't know. Like, it would just be hard to give him a good mix so where he could hear like himself over the music and that kind of thing. Um, 
Well, we recorded his vocals in a way where uh, I don't think that ever became an issue. Um, I found that Chris really didn't enjoy having people in the studio with him when he worked. Hmm. So I decided to set him up in the control room and record his own vocals because I realized that he he was perfectly good at being able to record and produce his work on his own. He, you know, he did it at home. And in that case, he shouldn't, there's, there was, would, would be no reason in the world why he shouldn't be able to do it in a, in a recording studio. Uh, you know, so we brought him in. I showed him how to uh, operate the tape machine, which channels to use, which, which ones to stay away from, uh, you know, and then we set him up with the mic. We didn't use headphones for most of that. Um, we actually ran a pair of, of monitors out of phase uh, and aimed them at the back of the microphone. So the pickup, uh, so that, you know, the, the back in cardioid of the microphone that rejects everything that goes to the back of the microphone. So the bleed was actually less than what he, the, what he was getting when he, he uh, listened through headphones. Oh, uh, so but he would still wear headphones or wait, no, no headphones, no, he, no headphones. No, he didn't have to wear headphones. No, he was just listening out of face, which can be difficult in that some is cases. Amazing. But he was no, he that's how he did most of the vocals. Wow. And I remember the first day he did that actually, never done it before, and he, <laughs> I you know I I just say to him, look, you know, have at it. Here's you know eight channels, six channels, whatever, like. Just record as many vocals as you want. When you're done, come up and get me. I'll come down, you know, and I'll I'll listen to him and comp him. And I remember he came running into the lounge <laughs> about a half hour into doing vocals, and he was like, "This is incredible. I'm never recording any other <laughs> way again." <laughs> you know, because he was able to just be himself in the studio and not worry about what other people were saying about him. Because he was pretty, you know, he felt he was pretty uncomfortable. Uh, let me ask you this. What about sequencing? Were you involved in that at all? Yeah. So yes, I was. So we're in the kind of the heyday where CD is the dominant format. Are you, do you sequence different going into it with that mind as opposed to a side A and B? Um, I never did. So you looked at it as, as like a first half and a second half. Pretty much. You know, I mean, I kind of, I, I, I like the feel of that for whatever reason. You know, it just kind of. I, I like the flow, but I also f thought of it as like a concert. Like what, you know, what are the peaks? You know, okay. what are the points where you're kind of like hanging back to give people like a little bit of <laughs> Getting space? Getting a t-shirt. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Great run of the know, bathroom. Or piss like... or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but like. I would have taken a leak during Spoon Man. The, all right. Yeah. Well, I, it sounds like it. It's not like uh, you and I are on the same page with Spoon Man. <laughs> you know, I've come to appreciate it more over time. I mean, besides, it's like it's part it's it's an important part of my life now. So like yeah. how am I gonna like kick how am I gonna kick it? It was a the huge I mean, song. There's no it denying it. It was. And people people love it to this day. So yep. I'm not gonna say i I'm I will not say anything disparaging about it at all. Uh, I, I will. Okay, you can. They, they can take a shot at me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I'm well aware that, that this is not a popular opinion. I have plenty of friends who, uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> that's, it's all right with me, man. <laughs> it's all right. Well, how about, um, so we'll, 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 so uh, in, on the sequencing of this, then uh, any insight there as to like anything that slid around, any discussions as like like were there any debates like no this needs to be moved or at all or spoon man it is the opening single and it's the eighth track on the album that's a little rare uh yeah but it felt like the right place to put it you know um the thing is is that you didn't uh back back in those days uh you didn't really have to concern yourself with um trying to front load anything i think people do that now because they're really concerned with trying with basically like shooting their wad as quickly as possible in case yeah. the record doesn't do well that's a so different like, era you, now yeah you just you just try and put all your strongest material to the front and just hope people like it like with a record like super unknown or even grave dancers union like 
you know, knowing that you have music that's that good, you don't need to put it anywhere near the front if you don't want to. You can just play sure. around with that. I mean, to put Black Hole Sun for as an example or Spoon Man at the front of that record would have been, in my opinion, one of the dumbest things that you could do. You know, you're also those being some of the most popular songs and, you know, obviously so you would have essentially spoiled the entire record for anyone who would actually want to sit around and play the record oh, that's and, a great and arrive point. at those songs organically. Yeah. You know, um, you know, so that, that would have really taken a lot of enjoyment out of, out of people really getting into the record, which fortunately many people do. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm con people constantly talk to me about songs that they love that are, you know, that were nowhere near being singles. You know, like Fourth of July, which funnily enough is a song that <laughs> the only song on the record that I mixed. Um, it, oh, and, I'm sorry. Uh, no, uh, it, it. I I just felt like sequencing that record. You really had to take into account a certain kind of flow, and you know, to 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 make something that would, you know, that that would that would that would interest people and would keep people wanting to hang on through the entire experience. I but I wasn't complaining about the sequence. Just to be clear, th this is damn near a perfect record to me. Um, well, thanks. Uh, I, I I may have. I a didn't sound like you were complaining. Okay, fair enough. I just want to make a clip. Maybe the listener would pick up on that. So, how did Brendan O'Brien get involved with with being the mix? Was that the plan from the get go? I know a lot of producers they step away after a project this big. So maybe that was the plan all along. Uh, well, I wasn't going to mix it. Okay. Uh, you know that was that that that's that was the bottom line. I mean, I. It's funny because like I've actually gone back to my rough mixes on the record, mm -hmm. and they actually it's a different it's a slightly different record, um, but I I picked Brendan, um, partly because of his um, cachet at that point. Sure. Uh, the fact that he was, you know, that that he was one of the leading rock mixers and also i felt that that his records had a certain excitement factor to them uh you know we tried a couple of other people and i felt that their mixes fell short also also i felt stylistically they didn't really match up with where this record was heading or i mean what it already sounded like at that point mm -hmm. um you know like scott lit who i think who is terrific really really good but definitely was not appropriate for this record at all uh you know plus i mean I, I felt we needed someone who would work on an ssl console um and that's that's what we tracked on anyway and i wanted to have someone who had that kind of facility um and brendan worked on the on an ssl so that's that's the basis on which he got involved in the project did you have any involvement on the 20th anniversary kind of deluxe super box edition of this thing um, not a bit, no. Wow, that's too bad. Eh, why? I don't know. I would like, you know, as a fan, I want all the people in the creative element to kind of come in. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> you know, and I don't mean in the, well, to go back to an earlier part, a kumbaya moment. You got, but the <sighs> fact of the matter is, you know, you were a key role in it. And I just think there might be something there to add to it. But uh, whatever. It doesn't, yeah, no, I'm it doesn't fine with it. <coughs> no, that's fine. Do you um, you've worked on a lot of great records. Uh, where does this stack up against you know? I mean, so many albums. I mean, I got your list in front of me, but uh... um, well, you know, I mean, it's a favorite, but you know, I got a lot of favorites. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I, I'm I'm really proud of I'm really proud of a lot of the records I've done. You know, yeah, uh, this is a particularly important one uh in many respects it's certainly the most popular record that i did uh and uh that's not inconsiderable but uh you know i i think it was it, it was very important for me in many ways it was a real it was definitely a pivotal record for me uh and it really kind of helped define my career in in a lot of ways but uh you know, I, I, it's, I think it's very easy in hindsight for a person to kind of take all kinds of credit yeah. for something. Besides, it's not as if you've got like Kim or Matt or Ben on the phone or even Adam to kind of say, hey, wait a minute. You know, 
And, and you know, yeah, but what about this? But what, one thing I will say is that beyond it being a group effort, which it absolutely was, um, there's also the element of serendipity and the element of the, huh, I guess, the William Burroughs concept of the third mind, which is <laughs> oh. when two are you familiar? Do you, you know any of Bur yeah, Burroughs? I know where you're going here, but uh, this is pretty deep. I love it. Keep going. Well, he wrote a he wrote a book called The Third Mind, and I mean the 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 general idea of the third mind is when it's almost like the magical child in like you know in magic, you know, through creative work when two people collaborate, they create a third consciousness. Um. And that's what this record is to me. It's not like it's not a body of songs. It's a consciousness. It's something that's actually a living entity to me. Like it's like a child. Do you have a favorite track? You know, no, no, I, I don't. <laughs> How about a least favorite no, track? No, I, I love. I know I love the whole thing in its entirety. I really, I really do. You know, it's it's very it's very personal to me actually. Like it's a very it's a very special moment in time for me and you know i it's 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 been there for me over the years uh you know because i you know i participated in its in its creation and you know i'm 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 like a surrogate parent in a lot of yeah. ways to it i'll tell you this a lot of people give well the the song half let's just put it that way gets a lot of shit i like it i enjoy it I insisted that that, record, that song be on the record. <laughs> oh man, it's perfect right where it is too. It's ben just kind of weird. Ben fought me on that. Yeah. Ben fought me on it. He's like, "There's no way this song goes on this record." I was like, "Ben, come on!" It was his song, this is, right? This is brilliant. This is is this so good? It completely rounds the record out and it adds an element to it that no other song is going to give. Please, you've got to let this song be on the record. It's got it's so meaningful. It's so personal. And he finally gave in. I'm so glad he did because it's a great, great, it's a great piece of, of, of work and it complements the record so beautifully. I couldn't agree more. I think it's, I mean, I probably wouldn't, you know, cherry pick it and put it on a playlist on, a, on an iPod or something like that. But when I'm listening yeah, to the, the point, exactly, this needs to be heard in, where it's at on this record, man. It's as purposeful mm. on that record as any other piece of music on that record. And that, no, I wouldn't necessarily put it on a playlist, but it 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 it, it adds something to the record that the record yes. absolutely needs, absolutely needs. And every time I hear it, it makes me it, it makes me feel good. I mean, that's Ben, that's his personality coming through on that song. And nice. He's a he's a very very important he, very important component in that band. I mean, without him, you you just don't get. You don't get Soundgarden. I mean, I, I didn't meet here. I didn't work with here. I know he was very important to the band too. But Ben just brought a whole different, you know, a whole different thing to it. And I, I, I loved him so much. I loved his personality. Um, you know, he was wild and crazy, but at the same time, he's a very sensitive, like you know, just big-hearted human being. And I love that that song's on there. I'm just so grateful that he that that he went for it. Michael, this has been a fucking pleasure. Like I said, I was looking forward to this. I'm a fan of producers and the work they do. And, and anytime I get a chance to talk to somebody who worked on a record that meant so much to me, it is just something I get kind of giddy. And it almost takes me back to when I was younger and a little bit of a fanboy and stuff. So, And you could not have delivered better. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. And, uh, well, oh, is there anything you want to promote? How Anything you got to, to pitch at all or... <laughs> to pitch. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you. No, I mean, I, I, apart apart from doing remote production and remote pre-production with people, which is something that I feel is incredibly important. And and by the way, two things, things that are completely lacking from the way people make records uh, these days. Let's hear it. Because no one no one takes the time anymore to really invest themselves in making a record. It's just kind of going to a studio knock a bunch of songs out, get out fast and hope that it'll, you know, that, that, that someone will, will actually like it. Uh, and the records that we're talking about, obviously were aggressively gone over with fine tooth combs yep. before, 
anyone even got close to a recording studio. I mean, my understanding is that Kurt, the songs that, that wound up on, on Nevermind, Kurt had been working on them for years. You know, I mean, that's talk about talk about pre-production, talk about like investing yourself in them. And these days, uh, you know, P artists aren't given any time or any chance to do any of that. So that's that's the kind of work that I'm doing now. I'm working with artists at every every level of the spectrum because I don't feel that this kind of thing should be limited to the people who can afford it. I think it's something that should be available to people at every strata because there are plenty of talented people out there, even people who are probably never going to release a, you know, yeah. a, a record or have like a, you know, a, a large commercial release. I feel that this is the kind of thing that should be available for, for anybody because, you know, also, also because the, the process, the creative process is so, it's so unique and it's so special and it's revelatory to the people who really invest themselves in that. And something I feel that everyone who wants to be creative should be able to experience at one point in their lives. That that means uh, so much to me. You have no idea um, that, that, that if you, you'd even take the time to say something like that. Um, I couldn't agree more. I wish I could give you a round of applause with 100 people behind me. but. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, uh, Michael. I, I I really did enjoy this. I I, I hope uh, I hope you, you did sir. too. Yes, I did absolutely. It's funny that it came out of the blue since I had you in a different day, but yeah. no problem either way. It worked out. Uh, so I yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I blindsided you. I, I'm not sure what happened there, but uh, anyway, uh, thank you Don't so worry. much. It's and probably uh, me. All right, take care. Thank you. You too.